The candidates for governor show clear differences in their first debate. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Daryl Rowland, public affairs editor for the Columbus Dispatch. Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press. Dale Butland, Democratic strategist, and Bob Clegg, Republican strategist. Ohio voters, if they watched, saw the two men who want to be governor debate issues on the same stage this past week. They disagreed on many issues, including abortion and legal marijuana. And neither candidate shied away from tough criticism of their opponent. Mike DeWine and I have very different views about why you should vote for us. He believes that after 42 years in politics, he's entitled to be governor because it's just the next step on the ladder. I want to earn your vote by working hard for Ohio's hardworking middle class. I run for governor because I want to take us to the next level. We've come a long, long way since Richard Cordray and Ted Strickland were in office. And the way has been upward. We need to take us the next step. Julie Carsmyth, you know, we feared this debate would be boring. I don't know why we would think that. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was, it was it, feisty. It was informative. What did you see? Yeah, I uh, was there. I thought it was very lively. Uh, it looked to me like a couple candidates who were well prepared. Uh, they were uh, backgrounded on their issues quite well, and they had a lot at stake, each one of them. I mean, Cordray came out first with his statement and went right on the attack, uh, explaining why he thought that DeWine was, uh, had been in office too long and was trying to paint this picture that he didn't uh, deserve to just be monkey move up to the next level. Uh, DeWine came back with some a couple of choice one-liners, and both of them called each other a failure. Uh, Mike DeWine even said Cordray has been a failure at every job he's ever had, uh, and and Cordray turned around and, and said, you know, newsflash, you were supposed to be the opioid czar, and you've done poor yeah. job at that. Daryl. Richard Cordray's had all these ads, Mr. Nice Guy carrying groceries for elderly women and things like that. He went r right on the attack in the first three seconds of his opening mm -hmm. statement, which is unusual to go after it that fast. That was a strategy to be the aggressor, I take it. Well, I think so. And I think if you if you looked at it, at least in my judgment, I think it threw Mike DeWine off balance a little bit. I, I think he was perhaps taken aback. Uh, but, you know, both candidates quickly uh, went, I don't want to say it's absurd, but sort of these... It's a real stretch to accuse uh, Richard Cordray for being part of the recession that caused Ohio to lose jobs. Um, <clears throat> for Rich Cordray to accuse Mike DeWine of basically opioid deaths in Ohio, that seems a little extreme. Not saying yep. maybe there's something there, he, more he could have done, that's legitimate, but it just seemed to be over the top. So they not only were butting heads to begin with, I think they went a little over the top. Bob, Mike DeWine held his own. Yeah. He, he gave as good as he got. Yeah. I thought he was fairly aggressive. Like you, I figured these two candidates with these two personalities, what kind of debate would we have? And it was a lot more um, uh, lively, like you said, than I ever thought it would. I do think, though, that um, Cordray made a strategic error, and that's when he went down the road to endorse issue one. Um, and we can talk about that further when we yeah. talk about the whole o opio op opioid crisis. This but is the ballot amendment that would yeah. lessen penalties for low-level drug I think offenses. I think that's going to be a problem for him. And, I, and that's the really the only thing I saw from his side that I thought will be problematic for him in the future. Yeah, so both candidates were landing, they were throwing their haymaker punches. But I think the difference is, is that Cordray most often you did his with humor. Uh, about the captain on the Titanic, and you know we had a drug czar. Uh, his name was Dewine. And you know the next time you see him, tell me. To... Dewine's attacks, I think, came off as mean spirited. One thing I learned a long time ago: I've been either run or been heavily involved in 12 different Senate campaigns in the state. One thing I learned a long time ago is the importance of humor. You can get away with a lot if you can make people laugh rather than cringe, because humor takes the edge off what you're what you're saying. And I think that punch lines are always more effective than punches. And uh, I think good that, humor is effective, Dale. And I, can't I think say Cordray used good humor. He well, tried to do humor. Well, let me just say though that I think the bigger problem for Dewine 
is that we have an election year, the midterms, which is always a change election. It is hard to be the credible agent of change when you've been in one office or the other for 42 years and you're in your 70s. And I say that Dale, as somebody who's got some long to Brown, this out. And I'm sure it would well, affect Sher his Sherrod is not in his 70s, uh, Bob. And, and uh, he hasn't he's been in his 60s he and he's held office since 1972, but that's not a problem for him, correct? But, but yeah. um, I. You know, the interesting thing, which both these candidates did uh, point out and eventually concede, is they've both been in the attorney general's office. One took it from the other. You know, DeWine took over that office and said that he felt Cordray had left it in a mess. They got really into some nitty-gritty details in terms of how BCI is being operated and things. I was surprised uh, Cordray didn't bring up the whole, you know, expired bulletproof vest issue. But... Um, uh, you know, in the end, I think that you saw DeWine uh, say back to Cordray, listen, you, we've both been in government a long time. Yeah. This is just how it is. And there was kind of a conciliatory tone at the end and just, hey, voters, here's why we want you. Look at some of the issues. First, Daryl, on the, the rape kits. Like DeWine's ads are really stressing how he cleared the backlog of the rape kits over his tenure as attorney general. He mentioned it quite a bit during this debate. Almost an, in the second half of the debate, every answer included something about the rape kits. <laughs> what's the strategy there? And is it a point where he can, what's he going for there? Well, I think it's a legitimate accomplishment, first yeah. of all. I mean, to test untested rape kits in various law enforcement agencies around the state to see if they, you know, they match in the DNA database. I think you got to give Mike DeWine a lot of credit for that, regardless of what party or who, which candidate you're for. Um, the nub comes in, you know, did Rich Cordray just sit on it and do nothing, as Mr. DeWine alleges, or did Rich Cordray sort of start down that trail? He was only attorney general two years, remember? And then Mike DeWine sort of took over and finished it up. And it did take Mr. DeWine seven years to get complete the statewide testing. Um, Cordray says, um, you know, he blames me for not doing it in two years. Well, it took him seven. Again, I don't know if that's fair back the other way. So, again, I think DeWine deserves credit, but does Cordray deserve the condemnation that DeWine is heaping on him? That's questionable, I think. Right, and I think what I noticed, uh, at, I guess, perhaps I'm watching it as a female viewer, but it, it came up each time that Rich Cordray mentioned Betty Sutton's name. I feel as if, you know, DeWine and, and his ticket feel a little vulnerable in this issue about around women and female voters and that, you know, they want to point out, hey, we've done our part. We've, it's advocacy. It's a Me Too movement uh, year. And, you know, the fact that they did that is, is important for female voters. May I, may I sure. offer something else, uh, not speaking about the rape kits now, but Julie pointed out, and she's right, this has been called the year of the woman, or the suburban woman in particular. I think that there's, that there's a real problem for DeWine in that he comes from a very extremist posture on abortion. Outside of the fact that he's talked about signing a heartbeat bill, which is probably unconstitutional because it would ban uh, abortion after six weeks before a lot of women even know they're pregnant. The other thing that's even more important than that, he says he would ban abortion with no exceptions, even for rape or incest. Now, let's be clear as to what that means. Under a Governor DeWine, a 12-year-old Ohio girl raped by her uncle would be forced to carry that fetus to term. That simply is not where most Ohioans are. Well, Mike DeWine did say in this debate he would yeah. sign the heartbeat bill, did not re yeah. rebut uh, Rich Cordray's assertion about yeah. the rape and incest exemption. Does that come back to hurt him in November? No, I mean, that's what he's, his position has always been. He has never changed it. Um, you know, uh, the abortion issue is an issue where, you know, you have some people that are on one side that have those beliefs. There have others that are on the Cordray side that want to have abortion past 20 weeks, don't know how late he would allow abortion, maybe up to nine months, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think he's really ever said. So, um, you know, there's, ex you know, there, there are positions that people just have, and you go into these kind of races knowing that. Abortion is an issue for certain individuals, but it's always been individuals, or usually individuals, that are already so hardcore on that issue, one way or the other, that that isn't going to affect who they vote for. Another issue, Dale, is Richard Cordray said he would vote to legalize recreational marijuana. He doesn't want it to 
be enacted by the legislature. He wants to go to the ballot. Mike DeWine said he would veto it. Yeah. But that's a far left position that Richard Cordray took there, you could argue. Well, yeah, I don't know how far left it is now. I, I think maybe a number of years ago it was. Uh, now I think that marijuana, recreational or medical, I mean, Ohio is already, you look at the polls, it's something like 80% in favor of medical. Recreational is less, but it's still a majority. But it's, close to 50 50. It, but, but when you, when you combine that, supporting legalizing marijuana with the supportive issue one, it really puts Cordray at a very pro-drug position <laughs> that is going to be tough for him to have to navigate through this year. Well, I think it's, it's absurd to suggest, as Mike DeWine always does, that Rich Cordray wants to leave drug pushers on the street. That's but absurd. He wants to reduce the no penalties. one is going to believe that. You wanna, no, you not, not, to for drug pushers, not for drug pushers, Bob. Not for drug pushers. Dealers are part no, of that. No, it's right. not, Bob. It, Speaking of drugs. Yeah. Each week between now and Election Day, we will take a deeper dive into a big issue. This week, we'll look at the opioid crisis, with nearly 4,000 Ohioans dying each year from opioid overdoses. What can be done and who is to blame for it is a key issue in this campaign for governor. But, Mike, your plan has been to announce that you're going to appoint an opioid czar. Newsflash, we've had an opioid czar in Ohio for the past eight years, and his name is Mike DeWine. When you see him, tell him he's done a lousy job. Absolutely amazing, Richard. Absolutely amazing. When you left the Attorney General's office, we already had a crisis in the drug problem. You did absolutely nothing. In my first month in office, we started closing pill mills. Yeah, Butlin, this is a nationwide crisis. Um, we'll get to, let's get to the plan here. Here's the getting, getting beyond the finger pointing. Here are the candidates' plans. Richard Cordray would declare a state of emergency with the aim of coordinating federal, state, and local governments. Cordray wants to spend more money on prevention and treatment. He's a little vague on who would pay for it, but he suggests drug companies. He calls for better support services for families of addicts and foster families caring for children left behind. And Cordray wants to provide better jobs to keep people away from drugs. Mike DeWine's plan is a little more detailed. He wants that drugs are, as we heard. But he also wants to declare a public health emergency. He wants to expand by 60 the number of drug courts, which divert offenders into treatment. And he wants to double the state's treatment capacity, again, using money from drug companies. And he wants to provide incentives to companies to help employees who are addicted but seeking treatment. Dale, again. Yeah. This is a nationwide problem. Yeah. Can we really blame either Richard Cordray or Mike DeWine for what is happening in Ohio? Yeah, probably not. But look, this is a major issue, as you say. The polls show it's one of the issues that voters care about most. So both these candidates are trying to get ahead of the issue. Uh, Rich is saying, Mike DeWine, you've had eight years and you haven't fixed the problem and it exploded on your watch. DeWine, for his part, says you're back in issue one is going to make it worse. It's unclear at the moment uh, which message is going to stick, which uh, candidate's message is going to stick. My own sense is, is that Rich's argument is probably going to be a little more plausible, particularly if he goes on television with a heavy buy talking about the endorsements he's received from the FOP and other law enforcement agencies. That's one of the differences, there between these two plans is DeWine's does sort of focus a little bit more on law enforcement than Richard Cordray's does. His is more on treatment. DeWine's is a little more lengthy. He's got 10 or 12 points on it. Right. His. Yeah, no question. I mean, hey, DeWine's the old county prosecutor. He's been AG now for almost eight years. Uh, you might ex expect that. And I, I think that is where you see the theme of, of the current attorney general. Um, he talks about, you know, how veto legalizing marijuana in Ohio. He doesn't want issue one. He wants to crack down on, on drug dealers. Um, you know, and the point he makes on that is prosecutors are often forced, in effect, to charge um, put our dealers with possession because they can't quite prove the dealing. So that is his argument uh, under issue one. Um, and Republicans, I think, are going to try to make hay with issue one. It'll be an interesting question as weeks go forward whether that will stick or not. Dave Yost, the attorney general candidate, also has come out against that. His opponent, Steve Duttelbach, is on the fence so far. I think that uh, the opioid issue, uh, it, there, there is a bit of a partisan divide here in terms of how candidates come at it. You know, a, a law enforcement uh, approach, uh, maybe less, uh, more on DeWine's part and maybe on, on Cordray's part, a look at treatment, um, reducing the numbers of people who are in prison, getting more social services, that kind of thing. It's, it's fairly 
um, traditional for those to be the breakdowns. Um, but, you know, we always see politicians where uh, a problem explodes on their watch. This one exploded on the Republicans' watch. Uh, the recession exploded on the Democrats' watch. And, you know, so voters just need to be aware that uh, sometimes uh, there might have been more effective solutions, but it isn't entirely the fault of those who are in power. Um, to the Bob, to the law and order tack yeah. that the Republicans have taken, in the past five or six years, even John Kasich has said we can't keep sending people to prison. Yeah. Are Republicans sort of sliding back to old habits, going no, war I on mean, drugs first, treatment second, or well, no? Well, I mean, you saw just with um, the Mike DeWine proposal that he's talking about doubling uh, treatment facilities so that people can be treated. So I think that's part of it. But I think it's part of just saying we got to get to where these drugs are coming from and shutting that down. And that's dealers. you got to shut it down. And he's looking at a more law and order uh, perspective to do that. Now, obviously, I think Cordray realizes he may have an, a problem here because, I, you know, I watch TV and I see he's got the Shelby County Sheriff on endorsing him and talking about the FOP endorsement. And, I, you know, that's probably a smart move on his part because he does come across looking very weak on this whole issue. Is it realistic to think that the drug companies and the lawsuits, whatever proceeds the state gets from those lawsuits, is going to be enough to pay for all of this? Or is the state going to have to kick in some money here for treatment, I mean? I mean, it's conceivable. I mean, the Lord knows how all that's going to end up. But, you, you know, the tobacco litigation, when that all shook out, you know, that was quite a chunk of change for Ohio. We built a lot of school buildings. Uh, with that money eventually. But, of course, that took years. That was a national settlement. Um, and then, you know, Ohio needs this now. And Ohio was, needed it yesterday. And that money was supposed to go to tobacco and it went to school. Well, <laughs> right. It was supposed to, right. It was supposed to go to treat people who are affected yeah. well, for their health. Yeah. And, and yeah, not much of it did. Are, I, I think drug dealers are at the heart of it, but, I mean, the prescription painkiller crisis did not start from drug dealers. It started from prescriptions. Dale, the thing about helping employers, giving them incentives to keep employees on the payroll if they're addicted but seeking help, that's a pretty creative and innovative thing, I think, that Mike DeWine has proposed. Well, so look, one thing, if the war on drugs for the last 25, 30 years has taught us anything, it is that we are not going to solve the problem on the supply side. It's got to be at the demand side, because as long as the demand is there, there's too much money involved. You can put border patrol agents shoulder to shoulder. Uh, along our borders, and they're still going to find a way in. So I think, uh, you know, Rich talks about uh, um, increased economic opportunities, job opportunities to, to keep people out of the despair and so forth that drives, drives them to that. I think that all of this is designed to get to the demand side of the issue, which is really where we have to solve the problem. Okay. The suddenly stalled Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh has become a campaign issue here in Ohio. While they differ on Kavanaugh's nomination, Mike DeWine and Richard Cordray agree the Senate should should hear from Christine Blasey Ford, who accuses Kavanaugh of sexual assault when they were in high school. Kavanaugh denies it. Even though only Senate candidates Sherrod Brown and Jim Renacci would have a direct role in any confirmation, the controversy hangs over all races. Daryl Rowland, you saw it in the debate. They brought it up. It's People are always asking, what do you think should happen? And that's what Republican candidates in particular in Ohio are going to have to answer. Yeah, and you're right. It's like the gubernatorial people, and especially the downtick people, have zero to do with this. But I think it goes to, well, the real question is, what is your attitude in this era of Me Too, in this era where we are going back X number of years and X more years about with all this awful bad behavior by males? Um, who's going to, you know, what do you really think about that? What are you going to do about it? I think, I think people are trying to gauge that attitude among people who are not even going to have a vote in that Senate. Uh, and, of course, it is coming up in the Senate race as well, and in, not, in a not very pleasant way. And in addition to that, I would, I would suggest this has to do with how candidates view what voters believe is political obstruction. I mean, we saw, we saw the last uh, uh, months of the Obama presidency, we saw a Supreme Court candidate blocked. Uh, from a, a normal process of appointment. Could that happen again now? And they want some signal from these candidates on how are you going to act when, when you're in Washington or when you're in office? Are you going to be one of these uh, politicians who is holding things up, who is playing politics, or are you going to be, you know, cutting right down the middle and, and looking at the issues for the issues? Bob, how do Republicans seeking office, how should they 
play this? Should they do it like Mike DeWine said? I support Brett yeah. Kavanaugh, but we need to hear what this and woman says. And that's what the Senate Republicans have done. Unfortunately, this whole issue just has a, so much hypocrisy and politics surrounding it. Um, I on mean, both sides, you could argue. Yeah, oh, I meant that on both yeah, sides, yeah. too. I really do, because, I mean... We've explained away behavior, whether it was Ted Kennedy and Bill Clinton or whether it's uh, Donald Trump and R Judge Roy Moore last year in Alabama. We, both parties have explained away behavior. And what that has done, it's normalized so much. Uh, we were told with Bill Clinton, it's all private. And remember the mental gymnastics Gloria Steinem had to go through to say the one grope rule to, to absolve him. It's gotten down to both parties. If you vote, if you're going to vote the right way on guns, abortion, taxes, et cetera, we'll take care of you somehow, some way. Um, the victims in all this, and I don't know who the real victim is yeah. in this one. Who knows? But they're not the center of the attention here. It's the politics. Any the Democrats, you know, they complain when they, uh, their court nominee was obstructed, and now they're holding this one up. Well, I don't know if they're holding this this one up. I mean, we're going to have a vote. It's going to be very soon. The question is, how soon? There, There is no deadline, except for the artificial deadline that the Republicans put, that we want to vote on Monday, then it was Wednesday. But, you know, I worked in the Senate for 20 years. I was there when the Anita Hill Act accusations against Clarence Thomas came in very late in the process after the FBI background check was already done. Same thing with John Tower when he was nominated by President H. W. George H. W. Bush to be Secretary of Defense. Allegations came in late about drinking. What happened was in both those cases the FBI reopened the investigation and went back and looked at it. That's routine. For some reason that I don't understand, the Republicans are refusing to do that. Due process starts with an, with an independent investigation. And, uh, you know, if, if apart from the fact that Dr. Ford has no reason to lie and no woman in her right mind would turn her life upside down and be subjected to the kind of abuse that she's been subjected to, uh, to make up some story. But more to the point, if you're lying and you're making up a story, you don't you don't ask for the FBI to investigate well, it Bob, because lying to the FBI is a felony. It is interesting, Dale, that they held up they held this information for two months, and they used the "we want to protect the victim" as the excuse. It's funny that they wanted to protect her in July, but not in September. And also, why the Republicans are concerned just this week, a Democrat senator from Hawaii said, you know what, if we get control of the Senate, we're thinking of maybe keeping that seat open for two years. So when you have one of your, one of your senators from your party stating, yeah, we're going to do the exact same thing to them, only we held it up for a year, not two years, what do you think they're going to do? All right, let's get to our last topic really quickly. Supporters of a plan to impose a tax on entertainment tickets sold in Columbus have trimmed back their proposal. It's still a 7% tax, but under the plan, smaller venues, ones that have fewer than 400 seats, would not have to impose the tax. Same goes for tickets that cost less than $10. So most movie tickets would be exempt, but the tax would generate about one and a quarter million dollars less. Still in the plan, 70% of the proceeds would go to arts organizations, 30% to take care of Nationwide Arena. Bob Clegg, you're no big fan of taxes. I was just going to say, Mike, you know me. I does, don't like taxes. Does, does this... Scaled back version stand a better chance. Uh, maybe slightly better. I still don't think it's it's a good idea. I don't think it's going to be very successful. I think they're still, even though they're trying to exempt movies, there are some that aren't going to be exempt. Those um, 3D multi. Yeah, you know, five star deals, and so, lounging chairs. Yes, and, the, and, and, and of course we're talking about the price of a ticket in 2018. What's going to be the price of that ticket in 2020? Yeah, 2021. So. Um, I just think, you know, there's got to be, I understand the reason why they want the funding, and I think that's a great reason. I just think they need to find a better way to do it. I think this still will affect a lot of middle to lower class people, a lot of elderly, and I think that's going to be the, the people that are going to be voting against it. Oddly enough, Bob and I agree on this. I, <laughs> look, sure, surely we need to do a better job of funding the arts in this city. Uh, and this modified proposal, the scaled back thing, is a big improvement. But given the strength of the opposition in this town to anything that looks like a bailout of Nationwide Arena, I am not sure that any ticket tax proposal that gives 30% of the revenue uh, to Nationwide is going to have enough support to pass. 
Is that the, is it the poison pill, Daryl, nationwide? That's, I mean, that's a big one. And, you know, from, well, even before it was built, of course, there was great opposition to using public money for that. And this is pretty much public money. All right, let's get to our off-the-record parting shots. Bob Clegg, you're up first. Um, and it's something we mentioned already in this show, but I really believe once the advertising starts regarding issue one, that that's, that, that's going to become a political hot potato this year. Um, I think especially not only in the governor's race, but also the attorney general's race, too. Yeah. With the midterm elections just six weeks away, college-educated suburban women were already a big problem for the GOP, but thanks to the unseemly rush to, to ram Brett Kavanaugh through the Supreme Court in the tone-deaf way they've bullied his accuser, that blue wave that's been building around the country very, may very well become a tsunami. Julie. Interestingly, next week, in addition to the Kavanaugh uh, developments, will be the sentencing of Bill Cosby again. Um, in a Me Too, in sort of the seminal case of, of the Me Too uh, movement among entertainers, the first one. And we'll see how the judge responds and how that uh, pr contributes to the blue wave or not. Keeps the issue in the news. Daryl. Um, I don't know if it's been publicly announced, but word is becoming public. Uh, I've had a number of my colleagues uh, take buyout offers from the dispatch, um, and, and especially WSU. Um, viewers, if you are also WSU fans, you'll recognize the name of Tim May, who's covered Ohio State wow. football for decades. Um, he is taking the buyout. Some other folks, Mark Snyder, another sports reporter, Mary Beth Lane, um, who's been with the dispatch for years after being at the Plain Dealer. Uh, several other key people that you may not have heard of at all, all very instrumental to the dispatch, and we will miss them all. Indeed. Well, good luck to all of them. My off the record comment if you haven't bought Brown's jerseys, now's the time to do it. If you want to buy stock and Brown's clothing, now's the time to do it. That's it for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, and each show is available on, den on demand at our website, WOSU.org. For our crew, for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.